Okay, hi. Um, so on Thursday from 2 to 3.30, I attended a session on Tales from the Homefront, green multi-unit residential from the developer's perspective. Um, so there were three panelists, and um, one was a low-income developer, a developer for low-income and homeless. Uh, another was a developer for... Um, basically uh, women who came out of the justice system and those with alcohol alcohol and drug recovery um, not in their phase of life or issues and then and then a for-profit developer but who had an affordable housing focus historic preservation focus transit oriented develop transit oriented development focus as well as kind of a new urbanism liking um, so all of them touched on that, well, the two affordable kind of lower income, um, focus panelists were said it's very important to make their home, home livable, sustainable, sustainable meaning not only environmentally, but also practical and low, low maintenance. So the durability and maintenance side of it and affordable. So they were adamant about we're not just putting a roof over a stockyard. We want to make these spaces beautiful and welcoming and healthy and long-term. And um, I, one quoted that um, children need space like natural air, and so do people. And so they work under kind of that mantra. They focus on low and no-cost green features like adaptive reuse, site selection, building orientation, increased R value, light shades that help bounce natural daylight, which I actually had not seen, um, and, and light shelves, so I'm, I'm personally going to look into that a little bit more. High ceilings that allow for deep daylight penetration, uh, low E windows, CFLs, light colored roof, um, dual light switches in the offices, low VOC, recycled carpet, that kind of stuff. The high cost stuff that they want, but they sometimes can't put on on uh, buildings because it cost are solar thermal cone elevator system, which I guess has no pit and is electric and it's much more efficient. Geothermal and wind turbines, and um, one of these were in Chicago and one of these were in Milwaukee. Um, the one in Milwaukee is committed to, to dignity through design and not only did they do lead but they also did green communities um, I'm sorry enterprise yeah green enterprise green communities which I had heard about but I didn't know that much about so that was good and the difference between lead for homes and green communities is this rating the rating systems are similar and they're holistic um, Lead for Homes has a provider fee and a green rater fee, and green community doesn't. And then green communities have kind of more mandatory categories, but they are not third-party certified. So those are the basic differences. Lessons learned um, that many of them said, shared all together, all three panelists, was take design, shred seriously, Create an OPR because it's you're actually writing it down and that helps you remember what the priorities were, especially towards the end of the project. Pay for early energy, energy modeling. It's worth it. Know what you are committing to. Um, know your certification strategy. Build in cushion points. Ask clarifying questions. Don't neglect central systems. Um, minimize green bling. I thought that was funny. Um, so a lot of funders want you sometimes get distracted by the latest innovation, but it might not be right for your project. So <clears throat> focus on the fundamentals is what they recommended. It might be green bling uh, if it's only for marketing purposes, it's untested technology, and um, you doubt end users can maintain it. They, they've, a, you know, especially with affordable housing and some turnover, maintenance and end user and training and education is a big, big deal. Um, build a strong design team from the beginning, get a GC early on, um, pay for engineering um, up, up in upfront design, and invest in training. And don't just hand out a manual. Do a hands-on training. <clears throat> um, 
So the for-profit one was uh, showed two places, and both were in Chicago. Um, they were kind of similar, you know, mixed use. One turning into an art center, which was very cool. And um, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna say two highlights from this. One is he shared um, this new paver technology that I had not heard about, which is called um, TX Active photocatalytic cement and it's basically smog eating cement um, so it can take pollution out of the air and turn it into CO2 which obviously there's issues with CO2 with carbon dioxide but it's better than carbon monoxide at least at the street level um, and apparently it was in Time Magazine's best innovations in 2008 so I'm gonna kind of look at look that up it also is self-cleaning so like I guess McDonald's is using this in Japan in their outdoor patios so with all the organic matter like ketchup falling on the ground this self-cleaning aspect to it helps with that um, the other thing I the this gentleman this panelist focused on was embodied energy and what I've heard in green build this year is project Projects are evolving. The knowledge is evolving, and people are getting more and more concerned about embodied energy. Embodied energy is like this whole life cycle analysis of where all the energy is used. So, the theme that I've heard in three sessions now is existing buildings have less embodied energy than taking something down and building something new. So, the two stats that I heard, well, this guy went to a website called thegreenestbuilding.org and was able to, it apparently has an embodied energy calculator on it. And he <clears throat> was able to do this comparison of existing versus new construction, or historic preservation versus new construction. And if he had torn down his building and built a new, he would have it would have taken him 64 years to recover the embodied energy to make up all the you know make up for all the embodied energy if he had built new. So that was astounding numbers. And then another, I guess a recent study came out. And now I need to find out the the. If I find it, I'll, I'll report later. But um, another, in another session, they reported it takes 35 to 50 years for a new home to capture the carbon back from if you had used an exist if you had rehabbed an existing home. So interesting things to think about. Um, some great resources out there. Um, there's a great website they recommended called Affordable Housing Designer Advisor. So that's at designadvisor.org. And then an energy efficient rehab advisor at rehabadvisor.pathnet, P A T H N E T.org. So that's my session report. Bye.